Welcome to episode number 154 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and my guest today is Rich Keilberg, who is the chief marketing officer of a huge company, Arrow Electronics. Rich, how are you? I'm, I'm really just great today. Thank you for, for including me again on your, on your excellent program. Well, it's just awesome to have you back and to join us. And before we start, I want to give a shout out and say thank you to Livestream for being just a tremendous partner for CXO Talk with the streaming. And I know they're a, you're a customer of theirs as well. So thank you to Livestream. Yeah, we, we are. They, they, do a, they do a tremendous job um, for, a, for even a, a big company like ours. Apparently, they, they can run the gamut. Uh, we, we, we really are, are keen on live stream. So, Rich, let's begin by, give us a background about Arrow Electronics, the size of the company, when it was founded, what the company does, things like that. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Michael. Uh, I will. And I'd like to, to uh, just say one thing before I do, which is the last time we spoke, and I know you'll kill me for this, we, we, we lost our connection, but I looked like a skeleton. Because the last time you said you'd be willing to talk to me was Halloween, and now, when and then and then I think I think you know I, I terrified you so much you said well, oh, or maybe you disconnected it. You said I, I can't listen to the skeleton anymore. You said well, that was pretty me. amazing, and and you picked the Broncos. Uh, you picked Super Bowl Friday around here in Denver, Colorado, our corporate office, and so it's Orange Friday, and I've got my little Go Broncos jersey on and all that. It's not. Not like every day at Aero Electronics is, is, is dress up day um, or that I'm just a circus clown every day uh, that you catch me. It's just that you schedule us on um, special days, I guess. Well, you so, know, there's, there's nothing better than color when it comes to enterprise software and to enterprise marketing. And so today at Orange Friday, we have color. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And I think that my, my colleagues at, at Arrow would say that, well, uh, color would be a nice word to describe what Rich brings to, to our organization. Arrow was founded, um, you know, in the 1930s or something in Radio Row, um, which, which uh, in New York, which coincidentally was right at the uh, uh, intersection of Cortland Street and down by where the World Trade Center was historically. And, and Arrow sold radios. And back then, we didn't just like buy an iPhone and where you buy the next iPhone, the next time. When your radio broke, well, you fixed it. Or when whatever your car broke, you fixed it. So people would come back into Aero uh, Radio and say, hey, our, you know, our, our radio is not working. And the people there knew which uh, tubes, which components would be the best value to repair these radios. And they found that it was an equally good business, if not a better business, to be selling the parts that went into these devices than the devices themselves. And rather than staying committed to a technology or an industry like radio, for example, Aero evolved with technology. So some radio companies, Philco, may have gone out of business because they said, well, who would ever buy a television? Because there's no television stations. But Aero invested in televisions. And when that exploded, there were more parts, more complexity, more components. And so that component business grew. And when black and white television gave way to color television, more electronics. In uh, the 60s and 70s with the electronics explosion, where electronics became a way of life, like uh, lava lamps or eight-track cassette players. And, and to have the right quadrophenic sound in your home was a lifestyle thing that said, hey, I'm really sharp. I'm with it. More electronics, more components. And Arrow grew bigger and bigger. We've, uh, and then, of course, with the explosion in computers, now the electronics industry is enormous around the world. Um, we're in 53 countries with around 18,000 employees, uh, revenue of uh, $23 billion a year, and um, actually grew a lot through acquisition. Over 100 acquisitions in the history of the company, a third of those in the last five years. So this is a rocket ship um, that I am attached to in my little orange Broncos jersey. So you are $23 billion in revenue. You've been around for 80 some years. What does that mean for marketing? So 
obviously the the profile of the company has changed and, and to, to be around for so long the company has to uh, transform and adapt many times. So how do you manage, how do you think about marketing, how do you think about the Arrow brand in the context of an organization that is so well established? Yeah, you know what, I think that is actually a really, really incredible question because there's good and bad about it. When a company's been around 80 years, and in those 80 years gets to $23 billion in revenue, it's doing a lot of things right, right? I mean, not that many companies get that big. And to get that big, you've gotta be doing something right, doing a lot of things right, okay? And when you're doing a lot of things right, the question is, why do anything different? Because different doesn't always mean different better. Different could easily mean this is not going to work. And we've, we've done perfectly well by staying on this track for 80, 80 some years. So you get the benefit of really smart people and really great infrastructure and operations and so on. But you also have this legacy issue to contend with about when is the proper time to, to try something new? When is the right time to innovate? And as we all know, in today's um, business environment, if you're not really trying to innovate daily, I mean, or at least being aware of the issues that are coming at you, the competitive pressures from um, industry, from uh, the, the marketplace, the, the market environment that we work with, customer needs, uh, changes in, in uh, distribution platforms. Like here comes the internet all of a sudden and, and, and uh, search engine uh, advertising. And, and, you know, if you're not paying attention to that, pretty quickly you can, get, you can get blown out. And when you're at a company with a long, long history, it's very easy to rest on your laurels. And in fact, rely on your laurels to somehow propel you into the future. So, so here at Arrow, you know, I, I, I've got to fight that thing a lot. And how do you fight it? So, so, so essentially, the fight then is the the established corpus of the business, the legacy, which is obviously great, brings stability, brings the history, brings the customers. With the fact that the world is changing around that business, and we all know that corporations are designed for stability rather than for rapid change. So, how do you manage that when it comes to marketing? Yeah. It's great. So here's how you fight it. You use the word fight. The way you fight it is that you embrace it and you respect it and you love it. And you say, I am so I'm blown away that the people who had my job before me and the company and the people who worked in this thing from the time it was selling radios in New York did such an amazing job that I'll be I'll be lucky if I add any value to that at all, I'm going to start from the premise that everything this company's done to this point is absolutely right. And it's imperative for me not to mess that up. And the only thing we try to do is look for areas where we think we might be able to improve things, not disregard the past, say, oh, you know, they don't, that's, that, that's, that's for fax machines or something like that, right? It's to say, the, People that came here before us were smart and we respect them and we're going to we're going to stay with those systems. We're going to stay with those concepts, but look at them independently and say, could we possibly improve upon this? And when we make improvements and we make recommendations, at least out of my department, they're not corporate mandates coming out of our department. They're efforts to improve systems, improve processes, improve ways of thinking about um, marketing and thinking about our business that that we, we bring out into the organization as opportunities or suggestions and we say hey if you like this run with it if you don't if you think it'll disrupt your business then don't 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 mess with it so it's all it's all it's, it's quite strange but in order for us to have any marketing program that gets adoption it has to be accepted by uh, the other executives in the organization through all the business units around the world and then, and, then, and then put into action. So respect tradition and embrace change. So for you then ensuring adoption across the company and acceptance of the, the marketing programs and the change that you're trying to introduce is a key part of your 
thinking that underlies your thinking. That's right. And the only way to get the adoption is by insisting on quality of work, not some corporate mandate because, you know, I report to the CEO or I'm in the corporate headquarters. None of that. Just by saying, if our team can produce work that for people who we respect, who have been so successful over the years, that they look at it and say, you know what? That is new. That is different. But it's great. Or at least I don't think it's going to destroy our business. So let me take it out in the market. Let me try it. Let me try it on this customer, supplier, or potential employee. And let me see how they react to that work. And after I see, if I see a positive reaction, then I'll prosecute more of it. I'll do more with you guys. So for me, the key to adoption, which I know that a lot of marketing uh, folks struggle with, is not so much worrying about adoption. It's worrying about the quality of production and the quality of the distribution of those messages. Because if we do that right, there's, there's, there's not really, you know, it's not an adoption question. It's like, can we have that? Give that to us. That's great. Oh, we didn't have access to something like that before. So tell us about some of the, the programs that you're working on. I know you're doing uh, branding activities. I know that you're doing a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, with digital. So, so tell us about that. Obviously, these are things that existed uh, I was going to say existed 80 years ago. Well, I guess branding did, but certainly digital didn't. But these are transformational activities. So, so give us some examples of some of the things you've, you've been discussing. Well, I would, I would consider uh, the work at Arrow around branding to be transformative because Arrow is in an industry that is traditionally characterized as oftentimes as a distributorship or B2B. And frankly, if I were to give you a list of Arrow's competitors, it would be highly unlikely that you would recognize any of these names. And it's not because they're not great companies. They're all great companies, but none of them have invested in branding so that there's any kind of name recognition to them. Um, they've invested they've invested marketing dollars, but primarily in product marketing. And so they're, 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 they're investing in ways that are driving incremental sales. But nobody until Arrow has stepped into this space is really invested in, in corporate brand for a B2B, oftentimes thought of distributor. And we, I've come under, I've heard a lot of criticism of that. Like, that's crazy. Why would you, why would you do that? That's a waste of shareholder resources. Or, you know, how do you, how do you prove the ROI on that? And what, what is that? And nobody's ever done that before. Well, that conversation to me is really intriguing because that's kind of the point is if you're in an environment with, say, seven great competitors and you're looking for something that you can do differently from the other seven, and, and one of them is, like, let's identify our brand, which really for most companies means let's, when we talk about the name of our company, let's talk about it in a positive light. You know, nobody, nobody does branding like, we, 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 we're horrible, <laughs> you know? So you're talking about yourself positively in the marketplace and you're the only one doing it. Well, that's going, you're going to be differentiated by virtue of the activity itself. Even if you, even if you don't even do it right, you're going to be differentiated. And, well, then, and then when you do it right, you're the only one doing it. And that's the space we find ourselves in. And I think we've seen really, really positive results uh, from this activity. You have a site called fiveyearsout.com, yeah. which I just tweeted. And it's an interesting site because it's, it's a summary, in a sense, of this very large and broad and complex company. So maybe tell us, tell us what you were trying to do with that site and why did you, why did you build it? Uh, we, we, we built fiveyearsout.com some years ago as a place where once we started advertising into a general market uh, environment, and actually this Sunday, Aero Electronics and in some select markets where we've actually got a preponderance of either employees or customers or shareholders, places like New York City, places like San Francisco, we're going to be running a Super Bowl ad around the third quarter. Um, and it's not lost on me that nobody watching this ad is going to say, oh, that was a great ad. I got to get me some microchips. You know, they might want to get some chips, but they're going to be chips 
with dip, not ships with, you know, electricity coming through them. So we're not going to sell anything. But what we are going to do is we're going to say something about this company. And, and I think these ads are, you know, people that have seen them said, these are great. And they'll attract people to come and see what is this company. And we need them to be able to come to a place that expresses the company in kind of its entirety without being so detailed and so specific and so complex that it just leaves people cold. Because I think this company is as complex as like, you know, General Electric. I don't, I can't, I can't begin to comprehend everything that GE does, but I got a positive feeling about them in general. It's what we're doing. And, and, and we set up this site for people to visit. And if someone looks at fiveyearsout.com, our hope is that they'll walk away from that experience saying, one, oh, I think I know what Arrow does, sort of. And two, that looks like kind of a cool company. Okay, that's it. If they go to the company website of arrow.com, they'll see an opportunity to, to, to transact with, with Arrow and to talk to engineers or purchase uh, whatever they need for, the, for, for, for whatever it is they're working on. Um, it's it's, it's, it's uh, transactional. But if you're running an ad in the Super Bowl, um, sending a lot of people who aren't going to transact in electronics um, to, a, to a transactional website um, is, is, to my way of thinking, you know, it's, it's problematic at, at best. How do you think about the ROI of your marketing efforts? These days, everybody is uh, very, very closely trying to associate ROI with their marketing. How do you think about that? Yeah, th thank you for asking the question. Uh, I, um, I, I have a bit of a, a, a rebellious, uh, I think is the best way I can describe it, attitude toward that, because I believe that the ROI question is a false one to begin with. Um, I believe it's false because I do not believe anywhere in the world there is a system to accurately measure ROI on brand marketing, okay? And because I think that if it actually did exist and someone had it, well, they would use it and they would be the greatest brand on the planet and they would be the only great brand on the planet because they would have measured everything to the point where they optimize everything and, and it, it just works. But branding also changes. Well, I mean, once you've, once you've, once you've optimized something, you've got to change all constantly. So the idea of measuring ROI to me is a question of how much money are you going to spend on measuring something where I've got a budget and I try to divide my budget into two categories, two categories only really. One is content, uh, content uh, creation and one is content distribution. And I believe that's all there is to marketing anyway is your message and how you distribute it. And I believe marketing works. And if marketing works, then the average message with average distribution works. Okay. Now, I can't tell you from an ROI perspective whether it returned the average campaign returned 1.6% or 3.5% or 7.8% or 1,600%. But I believe that the average market, uh, marketing campaign probably cleared the average company's uh, capital hurdle rate, capital cost rate, or they wouldn't do it. They would stop all marketing. Every company on earth would have stopped it. Nobody's stopping it. Why? Because the average one works. So from my perspective, if I've got an average message with average distribution, it's going to have a positive ROI. Now the question is, was that positive ROI 2%, 2.6%, 3.8%? And how much money do you want to spend dancing on the head of a pin like that? Now, I'm not saying we don't measure things, and I've got some studies here that can indicate that, for example, we worked with a, a firm on Arrow's reputation that indicates that, you know, um, it, in their way of looking at and analyzing things, one could argue that over a billion dollars of Arrow's market cap is attached to reputation, you know? And it, it t that takes me back to something. There's a professor at Harvard Business School, Professor Deshpande. I saw this slide. I thought it was brilliant. He said, um, your brand is not uh, your trademark. Your brand is a trust mark. And, and a trust mark to me leads into reputation. And reputation, I think, can be measured and monetized. Because I think that if not, then, you know, why would any of us disagree that if, if we had a chance to open up a soda company and they'd say, yeah, you can use the name Coca-Cola, we probably want to use that name because the, it has value, right? I mean, I feel like I'm arguing something that's so obvious, it's just silly, right? But um, at Aero Electronics, one can argue 
that a, a substantial amount of value is attached to that brand. And it's our job to see if we can't improve on that value. And maybe we can see it through those studies or, or whatever. But at the end of the day, um, you know, one of three things is going to happen. We're either going to do nothing. Brands just going to be the same. We're going to spend all this money and nothing's going to come of it. Or we're somehow going to spend this money and we're actually going to hurt the company somehow. Well, i am be allowed to do that for about a week and I'll be, I'll be fired. Um, or we're going to improve the position of this company in the marketplace. Now, specifically how much, mm, good luck measuring that. But as long as we continue this work and as long as the feedback loops in terms of the number of people applying for jobs here, the quality of people applying for jobs here, our customers and suppliers telling us, oh, I really loved your message. Oh, I really like the vision of your company. Um, as long as our own employees are saying, I'm proud to work here. I'm proud to work here. And I'm proud of these messages. And I'm proud to be sitting there watching the Super Bowl this weekend. And there's an ad for my company. I'm proud of this company. As long as we get that feedback, um, the precise ROI, I don't know what it is, but I, I, think I'll, I'll, I think I'll keep my job for a while anyway. So essentially what you're saying is in the broad mix, looking generally at the marketing activities and looking at the marketing results and measuring where you can measure, at the end of the day, there are some essentially judgment calls that have to take place because you can't measure it all precisely. And you can spend your entire budget trying to measure it all precisely. That's exactly right. I believe in every single marketing decision, ends with a judgment at some point. Now the question is, how much data do you amass? How much money do you spend? How many cycles do you spend? How much time do you let pass? Before you get to that marker, you make your professional decision and you live with the consequences of it, okay? I tend to believe you're gonna get a higher rate of return if you're able to accelerate that decision point, okay? To where you're comfortable enough in your, in, your, in your background and your training and your team and your partners to say, we're professional. This is good work. Test, you do whatever you got to do to get comfortable. And then you make that decision, you move. And I think the faster that you can do that, the more competitive you can be in the marketplace and the less resources you're going to spin, spin up trying to measure like, you know, if I got to spend a lot of money checking what I'm doing around here, then I would make the argument that the CEO ought to find somebody else for my job who, who doesn't have to check all that stuff to be able to move the company forward and make decisions. We have a question from Arsalan Khan, who's asking about the relationship between marketing and IT. And of course, everybody is wondering about that because marketing relies on technology and there's some got to be some relationship between marketing, technology, IT. So what's your view on that connection, that relationship? Yeah, I've recently come to this idea that uh, I, was at a, I was at a conference somewhere with a, a number of uh, really incredibly talented CMOs sitting around a table. And the moderator asked um, to everyone to go around the table and define yourself. Are you more of an artist or more of a scientist? I thought, well, that's an interesting question. And it was interesting to me that people in the room could answer that question because they actually kind of knew what that meant. And for me, in reflection, I believe that when you're working on the content, the message side, you're really kind of relying on the artist side of your brain. And when you're working on the distribution side, you're kind of working on the scientist side of your brain. And I believe that IT primarily today and probably, at least for my lifetime, IT is a really great tool, primarily along the distribution side of the message, okay? I can, I can use different platforms. I can, I can measure things a heck of a lot better. I can get immediate feedback and so on and so forth. IT doesn't really help with defining, you know, how should we shoot this advertisement? Which director should we bring in? What does the script look like in the storyboards, okay? That's more on the content. But the distribution side, and IT... I, with, with strong IT partners, all right, people who really know that game and know how, how it works and customer journey mapping and all the software that's available to marketers today, if you've got great partners in that, you've got a heck of an advantage across that distribution continuum. You still have to solve for, like, you know, if I give my IT partners uh, really kind of a, a bad message, 
and it's not going to work. And then, and then we can, I can blame them and they're going to go, what are you talking about? We're incredible. You just got a bad message, Rich. Or I can have an incredibly great message and I turn it over to my IT partner and say, help me distribute this, guys. And, and t- tell me how, and if they, don't, if they don't get it distributed out there right in, 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 in uh, the digital world, it won't work. So I, the way I see things with IT, they're, my, they're, they're the science part of the thing. They're the people who can really help with thinking about how do we, how do we get this message out to people uh, primarily. And, and uh, without, them, without them, I'm dead. Well, you've spoken a, a few times now about this distinction between content creation and content distribution. In terms of how you organize marketing at Arrow, can you maybe describe how each of these sides works and the connection between them? Yeah, at Arrow, it's at Arrow, it's it's it, Arrow is really interesting because of its history of acquisitions and because the CEO who I report to grew up through the company. I mean, he's had every job here and what's what what I, I i find to be interesting and and you know I'm, I'm gonna get myself in trouble for this is his background working up through the organization when he was in the or you know he's running a huge part of the company some somebody from corporate said mike you got to do this you got to do this he's looking what you're not in the field you're corporate you people are crazy i'm not listening to you I, you know it's like there's this tension between the field guys and corporate now now he is corporate <laughs> he's like oh he is corporate but he respects the autonomy and independent decision making of all these business units all these acquisitions and clearly respects that they've got p l responsibility so he'll tell me you know rich leave the business units alone you can't make them do anything they've got p l responsibility for their activity not you so you're just here to help them. You're not here to order them or tell them what to do because, you know, that's that's their decision. So at Aero Electronics, there's going to be 30 or 40 worldwide. I don't I can't even tell you how many now. I can't even name them all different marketing units that will have different practices, different partners. OK, theoretically, they'll all fall under our 350 pages of brand guidelines and brand uh, uh standards that we publish and, and, and release throughout the company. But if somebody followed those guidelines and they found that they weren't moving sales or it wasn't working for them, we're not going to live or die based on that. You know, it's some of these companies, I, I think about like, a, you know, it has to be hard for a company like, I'm just, I don't even know anything about McDonald's, but let's just say McDonald's where if a restaurant wanted to actually innovate something, how it would, how hard it would be for a, a one standalone McDonald's to innovate a sandwich or something, and then that spreads throughout their system. I think innovation from there has to come from, I imagine McDonald's corporate and spread out. Well, at Aero, we've got so much autonomy from our business units that it allows us with an overabundance of opportunity and different ideas, to be quite frank, many of which, you know, are bad. A lot of my ideas, I'm sure, are horrible, but they at least get tried. They get the, they get their day in court, and if they work, we, we, we press on the accelerator. And if we don't, you know, we learn from it and we move on. And, and this company's, nobody, nobody in this company's uh, an arsonist. Is that We're going to burn down a $23 billion corporation because we made a decision to try to sell a cheese sandwich at a McDonald's somewhere. I mean, so uh, what happens here is uh, all, all this stuff is just decentralized. And I have to do work that is of a high enough quality. I got, I got to be a, a standard bearer for, all these other marketing units who say, look, you know, okay, we're marketing uh, these computers or we're marketing the e- e-waste uh, recycling or we're marketing these components. But we're coming under the, the overarching arrow brand that that guy's doing. And if, if he does a bad job with our brand, it's going to make our job really hard here selling our components because he's making us look silly. So I have to maintain a really high standard. And my hope is if our marketing and our, our messages and our distribution are so, are world class, just great, everybody be proud of it, then all these other great talented marketing uh, business leaders from all these business units who say, that's the standard, that's the bar, let's, let's rise up to that. Let's do, let's do quality work at that level or above. Um, and, and, and then we all learn from each other, we talk about it, talk about the things that don't work try to make this company better. And, um, you know, fortunately, we're not in a space where, you know, Coke and Pepsi are so used to beating each other up in the, this area 
but they've gotten, they got to be real refined about it. In our industry, like I said, say seven competitors, we're the only one doing it. I mean, right now, I, mean, I hate to say it, but I kind of have to beat myself because I don't ha- we don't have anybody else doing this. And, and maybe it's just because they think that what I'm doing is silly. I don't know, but uh, it, you know, uh, looks like, it looks to me like it's working. Well, tell us about the top two or three elements of your special sauce. You've been kind of talking around a bunch of different things. When you boil down, what are the top two, three, four things that Rich Kyleberg uses as the basic premise for marketing at $23 billion in revenue, Arrow Electronics? What are those three, four things? You know, yeah, that's, that's great. And, and, and it, it might not be a satisfying answer, but first, um, believe in, believing in myself. As, as marketing professionals, uh, you know, what we do is, is different from what finance does. And, and frankly, if you've got marketing professionals in finance, you've got Enron. You know, it's make up numbers. That's not good. And if you just have finance people doing marketing, well, it's like, how do we cut more costs out of this? Whatever, they, whatever, whatever that be. You know, and, and, and so, you know, you, you deal with people that come from a different perspective and don't necessarily understand marketing any more than I understand debits and credits or HR or whatever else. But you have to have, you have to have belief in your yourself so that when someone says, that's the dumbest message I've ever seen, a lot of marketing gets subjective. You know that you can actually stand up to your work and believe in it, and 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 say, you know, really at the end of the day, if you don't like what I'm doing, you know, just get, get rid of me. And then the second thing is believing in your partners and really believing in your partners to where it's like, just do great work. Primarily when it comes to the content creation side of the equation, and we work with agencies, a lot of agencies, and a lot. And I can tell you now, when, when I meet with agencies and people say, okay, what's the scope? What, what, what do you want? Um, and, and I basically say, I want the best work you've ever done in your life. And they, and they look at me like, well, what on earth is that supposed to mean? I say, I'm not even sure what it means, but I'm looking for 30 seconds of like the greatest 30 seconds you've ever imagined. Now, I, it's got to fit within our brand standards. It can't, we don't, we don't do potty humor or something like that. We don't have a little green lizard that tells jokes. You know, it's got to fit within the, basic parameters of our of our of our character and our brand but what's the best thing you could possibly do and and then we sit back and and let them do it and don't correct them and don't course correct because i found that our partners always inside of themselves if they've been around for a little while and you've seen some work that they've done and this is important every time you interview an agency or you talk to somebody you say let me see an example of your work they show you the best work they've ever done and they don't show you the worst thing they ever did they show you this is the best thing I ever did. And I just say, I love that. Can we do something better than that? And I've had some people say, well, that'll be hard. And I said, well, okay, if you're done doing better things, if, you, if you've peaked already, like some kind of, you won your Olympic gold medal, then okay, then I don't know that we want to work with you. But if you've got something else in there, you've got one more great, you got one better than this, that's the one we want. Let's do that one together. And, and, and then what ends up happening is they dedicate themselves to it. And I think oftentimes they've already got the idea inside themselves, but other clients have stifled it or said, oh, that's a bad idea. Uh, you know, I want Rolling Stones instead of Beatles or Blue instead of Red. Well, if you let, the, let them go, you end up with incredible creative. And, and sometimes you don't, but you don't have to run. I mean, you, you just work with these people to bring out the best in them. And, 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 and there you go. So get, I guess there's my, there's my things is, is, is believe in your partners, believe in yourself, uh, believe in this profession and, 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 and fight for it. So you're managing for greatness and you have very, very, very high expectations of the people that are doing work. You're willing to experiment, you're willing to try things out, but at the end of the day, you have very high expectations, it sounds like. I have to, because I have no ability to drive mediocrity through this corporation. All I can do is put up in front of people what we produce and hope that they will take it out of our hands. And the only way I know that'll happen is if the work is extraordinary. And that's why, and and I'm telling you, you know, for a company like Aero Electronics, any company out there, you produce an ad, and if you can find a way to put it on national television, the first ads we ran were on CBS Sports, and we were on Sunday Night Football. Now we're going to be in these big markets in the Super Bowl. 
when you can put your creative and it's in that context and it's sitting there next to Nike and it's next to the auto manufacturers, it's next to the most amazing, beautiful content ever produced by man. And if your work can stand up next to it and not look like, what was that? It's like a used car dealership, horrible thing, right? It elevates the company and everyone working there feels like that's the kind of company I work for. I may not work for Coca-Cola or Nike. I work for a company like that. I work for a company that can stand up next to those things in that messaging and can do that. And, and it generates this incredible pride. And, and, and so, yeah, the, the, you know, the high standards thing. I mean, I know it sounds like just talk. Who wouldn't say that? Who, who wouldn't say that? Right. That's obvious. But for us, it, it's, it's like a condition of my continued employment here. And I'll also tell you that in marketing, what we do as marketing professionals, all right, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an incredible gift because we change people's lives for the better, okay? We send out messages that make people feel great about themselves, we solve problems, you know? There's not that many people in the world today that get to actually work on a commercial that'll be shown in the Super Bowl. And I get to do it. And I take that as such an incredible honor and opportunity that um, anyone in marketing ought to feel that same way. And it doesn't have to be Super Bowl. It can be the local newspaper. You get to make that decision. You get to change lives for the better. I mean, oh, wow. This is a great profession. Wow. Well, we have a question from Shelly Lucas on Twitter who asks a really good question. How do you balance the goal of extraordinary content quality with the expectations associated with volume production? I don't, um, yeah, thanks. I don't actually face uh, demands of, uh, of, 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 um, of quantity of production. Um, we recently did at Aero Electronics at five years out, there are really 10 categories. We call them Vs that we operate in, whether it's lighting, aerospace and defense, uh, cloud, IoT. And we set out to do 10 little short videos describing these things. And we got nine of them that were really, we got nine of them. One of them was really bad. One of the 10 was bad. Two or three were kind of you know, okay, but they were passable and, and the rest, ranged up to extraordinary. Um, we just, we just, we just aren't going to run the one that's bad. We're working with a production company. I'm still going to pay them for it. I asked them for their best work. I didn't give them any, they're not happy with it. They're going back and they'll keep working on it. And when they get it right, we'll distribute it. Um, what ends up happening, I think for Arrow, I mean, if you look at the body of work we've done, it, um, like at uh, some of the video stuff is on YouTube at a thing called Arrow, the five years out channel. And the, volume of work is, is, is actually kind of remarkably high um, in terms of, you know, a lot of companies would get a campaign like that every year or two. We can put out four or five a year uh, just by virtue of working with multiple agencies in multiple areas. Um, and I don't have a really big budget here. I know, I know it kind of sounds like I do. Um, but when, 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 in my experience working with agents, if, if you talk to them and say, uh, would you like to partner with us to do the greatest work of your life? And, and, and they believe you and, you and you live up to that. They'll do it for, you know, it's like you got a 50% off coupon, you know, or 75% off coupon. Or they'll keep working on stuff just because they believe in it and they won't even bill you for it. Even a giant corporation like Arrow, it's because it's it transcends the, the, the financial aspects of the relationship. And so I believe that we end up with a, we've actually end up with a lot of quantity of work. All right. Um, but it's all high quality when it comes to quantity, like uh, people uh, in, in getting onto social networks and creating content at that level, we have a, we have a, a, a communications hierarchy where we've got the, the, the brand message at the top, guiding innovation forward five years out at the top. And then we do national uh, television commercials. And then under that, we do commercials around things like lighting, aerospace, and defense. And under that, we start doing um, uh, solution cell sets. We do line cards. We do, um, you know, our price sheets, all the way down to a business card. And when you get, as you go work your way down from a national commercial, a national commercial, 
we'll do a half dozen of those a year. And when it comes down to a line card, you do thousands of those a year, okay? But, but there's different levels of production. And so in-house, we've got a lot of people who can do that uh, lower level production. The, the quality of it isn't that high, but you know, where you don't want to have a really poor quality uh, national commercial, you also kind of don't want to have a really high quality little brochure where you hire Ogilvy and Mather to do a brochure about some semiconductor part, you know, and it really looks great, but you sell 200 of them. Um, it's all a matter of, of proper scale. You know, we have just a few minutes left. And so one of the challenges that many marketers face is getting the organization to see them strategically. I think a lot of IT people face the same thing, but from a marketing standpoint, what advice do you have for marketers who want to have a stronger strategic relationship with other parts of the company? Um. How's that for, you know, just, to, just as we're ending, right? I mean, yeah, we could talk for an hour about that. But. <laughs> my advice to it would be, you might want to think twice about that, that, that wanting to be strategically involved with the business units, right? Because, yeah, I, 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 I get that temptation. I've been involved in that. Um, you know, oftentimes what happens is, in my experience, when you're working really closely with business units um, to, strategically, uh, if things – if I mean, I, I don't mean to be a jerk, but if things go wrong, it's kind of easy then to blame the marketing guys, right? Uh, and, and, and just because you're involved in it. Um, I, I prefer to play a, a supporting role where if a business unit um, is, gonna, is, is working on a strategy and so on and so forth, I, I try to conduct myself and, 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 and our team in a way that our opinion and our advice is valued, but that's all it is. You know, because we're never going to know as much about the markets that they serve as they do. All we've got is the information that we can glean from them, and we glean from the marketplace, and then we go forward. But they know it; they know it better than we do. And if not, we got a real problem. If 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 we know what the business unit strategy should be better than they do, um, that's a real problem. So, you know, I try to stay in in an advisory capacity on an as called basis. We're working very closely uh, now with our uh, Internet of Things teams around here because they like the way we think about things, the way we like the messaging. At the end of the day, we just make some recommendations based on our professional experience. Whether they take those that advice or not, you know, I, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, you know, so oftentimes I get awful excited that I, I know everything and I'm so smart. I'm really not. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong, but I'm a part of a team here. I'm trying to help. Um, at the end of the day, kind of like, I got to make the decision. Okay, we're going with that ad. Or, okay, we're buying the Super Bowl. Or, okay, we're doing, I got to make that decision. They got to make the decision. Okay, here's the, here's the market sector we're going to target. Here's our pricing. Here's how we're going to go to market with this stuff. And um, so that link, um, I think, is one to be very careful about. I've also found that as I've disconnected from uh, business unit decisions, um, it's freed me up to focus on more visionary aspects of the company and, and the brand. Okay. The, the really, what does arrow stand for in this world? And if I'm not working on that, then kind of nobody's working on that. And there's a lot of people working on this, you know? And so as much as I get tempted to be drawn into these conversations about how can I help drive the business forward and so on, um, it's probably in the best interest of the corporation for me to be a little bit separate and, and, and be trying to think um, at, a, at the 50,000 foot level about how do we drive this company relative to competitors in a macro, uh, macro way. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. We've been talking with Rich Kyleberg, who is the chief marketing officer for Arrow Electronics, a $23 billion in revenue company. And Rich, you've really pulled back the curtain on how marketing functions. So thank you so much for, for taking the time and doing that today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for including me. And I, I hope I wasn't uh, too too verbose or, or, or challenging for folks. But uh, I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity to, to share some of my experience here and, 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 and cheer my colleagues on. Man. Well, it's been a lot of fun. And I hope that you'll come back and do this again another time. Anytime. Thank you. 
everybody, thank you so much for watching and we will be back actually on Tuesday. There's a special edition of CXO Talk. I'll be doing this live at the Saster Conference in San Francisco in front of uh, 5,000 people. And that will be at four o'clock Eastern time on Tuesday. And then next week we have another show on Friday. So everybody, thank you so much for joining and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.